to our service here this evening. It's good to see you. If you're visiting with us, then you're very welcome indeed. There'll be some uh, uh, refreshments served, cold drinks and hot drinks and so on uh, at the close of the formal part of the service up here and downstairs. So please do stay and uh, enjoy that time of fellowship together and encouragement of one another. In a moment, we're going to sing, but uh, let me read some words from the beginning of Psalm 99. The Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. Well, we're going to sing these words in a version of that psalm. It's at number 99 in our blue books. The Lord is king. Tremble, O earth, and fear him. Well, let's pray together. The psalmist says, O Lord, you answered your people. You were a forgiving God to them, but an avenger of their wrongdoings. Exalt the Lord our God. Worship at his holy mountain, for the Lord our God is holy. And how we thank you, Lord, for your holiness, your wholeness and wholesomeness, right or righteous in every way, full of mercy, 
full of compassion to forgive, to hear your people, to graciously and gratuitously forgive our sins, and yet not to be unmindful of wrongdoing, not to be a God who turns a blind eye to wickedness or injustice so that you connive with it or approve of it or celebrate it, as so often is the case in our world, but you punish wrongdoing. You cannot look upon evil. And this is the great mystery at the heart of our faith that you are a God who hates sin and must punish sin. And yet your love for sinners is so great, so deep, so marvelous that you have reached down to save us. You have found a way to be just and to be the justifier of those who have faith in Jesus Christ, your Son, by bearing in your own self, in your own body, in the person of our Lord Jesus, on the cross, all our sin, all our shame, all our punishment, just and true. And so we can marvel, Lord, at your holiness, at your purity, at your justice in the face of sin, and we can also exalt your great, marvelous love and grace and mercy. And so, Lord, we come before you tonight rejoicing that you are a God like this, not like the gods of this world, the figments of the imagination of man, where there may be love but no justice, no justice and punishment but no grace and mercy and forgiveness. We praise you that you are the God that we need. God who is all that you've promised to be to us as sinners. So, Father, we pray that as we learn more of you tonight from this, your word, the words that you've given to us, breathed out for our salvation, breathed out for our instruction, our training in righteousness, that we might be fully equipped to know you and to love you and to serve you the better. We pray that you would open our eyes and above all, open the eyes of our hearts that we might understand not only with our minds but deeply in the heart of our being, in our hearts and in our wills what it means to love and serve you. Teach us new things, we pray, about your greatness and your glory. Fill our lives with hope, with comfort and also with challenge that we might always be challenged to be more and more the people that you have called us to be and you want us to be and you by your gracious spirit are working in us that we should be we come tonight Lord from many different places some of us may be very new to our fellowship here very new even to your word in scripture very new to the whole understanding of Christian faith. We pray, Lord, that whether we come tonight from a lifetime of studying your word or whether it's fresh and new and exciting because we've just come to it or stumbled upon it or had our eyes open to it, we pray that however we come, you would send us from this place tonight thrilled with the wonders of your truth having learned something new, something wonderful, and having been drawn closer to you, our God and our King. So hear us, Lord, help us, we pray, in our responses, in our prayers, in our praise. Make us worthy, we pray, of you, our great King, and of your glorious kingdom, which you have shared so marvelously with us. So hear us, draw near to us, and help us, we pray. For we ask it all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Just uh, one or two notices this evening. There's a, a rather truncated notice sheet here that if you didn't receive this morning, they're on the trolleys outside. There are lots of things in abeyance for the summer, but uh, our Wednesday lunchtime service takes place as usual. Uh, on Thursday evening, we have our summer Release the Word program. That's an opportunity for uh, students and young workers who are still around in the city during the summer to come together and to learn together and encourage one another in the Lord 
And uh, similarly, on Friday evening, our Farsi Bible studies will be taking place as usual. So uh, come along at 7 o'clock, either on Thursday or on Friday, and uh, you'll be made very welcome indeed. Next week, we uh, meet as usual twice in the morning, first at 9 at Kelvin Grove, then at 11 here, and then in the afternoon at 4.30, and in the evening again here at 6.30. And uh, you're warmly welcome to join us uh, in those times. Well, we're going to sing again, and uh, you'll find the hymn at number 513, 513 in our hymn books, and it's a plea for the kingdom of God to come, for the rule of our Lord Jesus Christ to begin and to break the tyranny uh, of sin. So we sing together number 513. Well, that uh, hymns asks a lot of questions about when, when all these things that we're promised will happen. And uh, the chapter we're going to read now tells us the answer. It's Isaiah chapter 32, and uh, you'll find it if you have one of the church visitors' Bibles, I think on page 592. Is that right? Page 592. Isaiah chapter 32. And Bob will be preaching to us shortly from this chapter. We looked... Uh, last week at uh, the preceding two chapters, oracles about great judgment on the enemies of God's people. But here is a much brighter and a very wonderful chapter indeed. Isaiah chapter 32 and verse 1. Behold, a king will reign in righteousness, and princes will rule in justice. Each will be like a hiding place from the wind, a shelter from the storm like streams of water in a dry place, like the shade of a great rock in a weary land. Then the eyes of those who see will not be closed, and the ears of those who hear will give attention. The heart of the hasty will understand and know, and the tongue of the stammerers will hasten to speak distinctly. The fool will no longer be called noble, nor the scoundrel said to be honorable. For the fool speaks folly, and his heart is busy with iniquity to practice ungodliness, to utter error concerning the Lord, to leave the craving of the hungry unsatisfied and to deprive the thirsty of drink. As for the scoundrel, his devices are evil. 
He plans wicked schemes to ruin the poor with lying words, even when the plea of the needy is right. But he who is noble plans noble things, and on noble things he stands. Rise up, you women who are at ease. Hear my voice, you complacent daughters. Give ear to my speech. In little more than a year you will shudder, you complacent women, for the grape harvest fails, the fruit harvest will not come. Tremble, you women who are at ease. Shudder, you complacent ones. Strip and make yourselves bare and tie sackcloth around your waist. Beat your breasts for the pleasant fields, for the fruitful vine, for the soil of my people growing up in thorns and briars. Yes, for the joyous houses in the exultant city. For the palace is forsaken, the populous city is deserted. The hill and the watchtower will become dens forever, a joy of wild donkeys, a pasture of flocks, until the Spirit is poured upon us from on high. And the wilderness becomes a fruitful field, and the fruitful field is deemed a forest. Then justice will dwell in the wilderness, and righteousness abide in the fruitful field, and the effect of righteousness will be peace, and the result of righteousness, quietness and trust forever. My people will abide in a peaceful habitation, in secure dwellings, and in quiet resting places. And it will hail when the forest falls down and the city will be utterly laid low. Happy are you who sow beside all waters, who let the feet of the ox and the donkey range free. Amen. May God bless to us this word. We're going to sing now another hymn, number 682, great hymn of Charles Wesley, as he sings of Jesus, the lover of our souls, and asking that we should hide until these storms of life are past and the boundless grace of the kingdom of God is imparted. Number 682, Jesus, lover of my soul.
Well, as our offerings for the Lord's work are received now, we have a few moments of quiet as the musicians play. You might like to read again and meditate on these words of the prophet that we'll be studying shortly, uh, or perhaps just to be uh, quietly uh, in prayer. But as we do that, our offerings will be received. Let's pray together. And we're going to remember particularly at this time many young folk around uh, the country at camps and missions and many families also on holidays and enjoying time together with their young ones. Our gracious Father, we thank you for this time of school holidays when many families are able to spend time together to enjoy one another's company, to rejoice together in the gifts of uh, little ones that you've given them, the gifts of children and parents, and the many joys that will be being shared in many places by those in our fellowship here at this very time. We thank you for that blessing of family life. And we do pray, Lord, in a world where there is such pressure now in so many ways from so many directions on good, normal, healthy marriage and family life, we pray that you would guard and keep and protect our Christian families. Give them confidence in your way, in your pattern, divinely created and made for fruitful and for happy family life, for children, for their education, for their nurture and bringing up in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the teaching of his way of truth and of your holy and just law that is the instruction for human flourishing on every level. We pray, Lord, especially for those who are away at camps and Bible conferences and so on, seaside missions at this time. I think of many of our own fellowship here who've been involved in this last week at Lendrick Muir, many involved uh, this week now in uh, Strathallen at the Contagious Bible Camp, for others, Lord, that will still come, for some who are abroad in Ukraine and other places, teaching young ones the way of the Lord Jesus Christ, many of whom uh, perhaps come from no background, no Christian faith, no understanding of these things at all. We pray, Lord, that there would be rich opportunities for many to share not only the word of Christ, but the presence, the love, the, uh, the beauty of Christian family as exemplified by brothers and sisters in Christ together, welcoming and cherishing those outsiders, drawing them into that love, that place of knowledge and teaching, and giving to them as they would give to their own family, to their own children even. We pray for many young hearts and lives to be touched and changed, challenged by the gospel of our Lord Jesus. We ask that many would go home to their parents 
asking them that they might be able to continue in scripture union groups and other similar in schools in youth groups and churches where they live we ask that the seed that is sown would be nurtured and watered and fanned into flame in their lives in the coming weeks and months we do pray lord for all our own uh, young people in the church here from the students right down through school and to the very youngest ones who from their earliest years have the joy the privilege of being surrounded by the knowledge of the love of god in jesus christ we pray lord for their nurture in every way in their homes and their own family and also in in the church family that you would help every one of us whether we are married or not whether we have our own children or not to see the task of witnessing to them loving them praying for them helping parents encouraging children to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the lord jesus christ to see that as our mission here together and as the calling that you've given to us we dare to ask father that many who grow up and are growing up in our midst would grow not only to be your servants all the days of their lives but many of them to be soldiers warriors for the lord jesus christ servants in his vineyard in all parts of the earth many of them becoming leaders in christian ministry and mission and evangelism and church planting that they would take and steward the great gifts that they have been given the great privileges that have been theirs and that they would use these things in their lives that throughout the whole of their lives they might bear fruit wonderfully for you in the years to come we give thanks lord uh, this week for the latest birth of young callum to uh, jen and alistair cameron we thank you for another little one born into the fellowship here to grow in the nurture and in the admonition of christ we pray for them and for that new family that you would bless them richly give them joy and gladness in these early days be with them and help them in all their parenting that is to come we rejoice also with ash cunningham and with susie as they've become engaged this past week and again we thank you lord for the prospect of another marriage union the better to serve the kingdom of our lord jesus christ in this world and so lord we pray for every one of us that we would honor the command that you give us that marriage should be held in honor among all whether we ourselves are married or not we should honor it within marriage by faithfulness and fidelity and honor it without marriage by chastity and by honor of that institution of the only sexual union sanctioned by you to be held in the highest honor and the marriage bed to be kept pure help us all lord by the way we think by the words that we use by our actions by what we say to be seen clearly to honor the family structures that you have blessed not only your christian church with but indeed all human beings we might showcase to the world health and wholeness fidelity faithfulness and goodness and truth and true love in all these and all our other relationships that the world might see in us a true pillar and buttress of truth a way of light and life in a world of darkness and sadness and so lord to that end again we ask tonight that you would enrich our minds and our hearts once again by your word draw near to us send your word your light and your truth deep into our hearts we pray that we might know you and love you and serve you the more for the sake of your great love for us amen well it sounds like we've got competition in the singing so you will have to sing loudly as we come to god's word and we're going to sing together number 490 and uh, we shall sing in english and our brothers and sisters downstairs will sing in farsi and the Lord will hear a joyful noise from 25 Bath Street tonight. Number 490, Jesus is King.
Now, could we turn back again, please, to the passage that Willie read for us, which is on page 592, um, Isaiah 32, and let's have a moment of prayer. God, our Father, we pray you will give us sincere and open hearts as we listen to your words and help us to pray with conviction, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we ask indeed that as we live our lives on earth, we may increasingly, by your power and by your spirit, anticipate that kingdom which is to come where Jesus Christ will reign forever and ever. And we ask this in his name. Amen. Now, for thousands of years, the church has prayed these words, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And when we pray these, when do we expect it to be fulfilled? Indeed, do we expect it to be fulfilled? Because fulfilled it will most certainly be, or Jesus would not have encouraged us to pray for it, would he? Now, of course, you may say the kingdom will come whether we pray your kingdom come or not, and that's true. But the Lord gives us that prayer, gives us that hope, gives us passages like this to help us to anticipate this. Now, Isaiah, as you know, is full of prophecies of the coming kingdom, many of which are taken up in the New Testament. You remember when Jesus began his ministry, he came into Galilee preaching the kingdom of God. And they're taken up particularly in the book of Revelation. Now, these passages have often been treated as roadmaps. A great deal of fruitless speculation about the sequence of events which will surround the coming. A number of years ago, I was preaching in Belfast on Daniel chapter 7, which is a chapter about the coming of the Son of Man and the setting up of the kingdom there are some cryptic verses there. There's one in particular who says that the horn, that's a symbol of power, will overthrow three kings. And I said, I've no idea who these three kings are. Undoubtedly, this will happen in time and space, but I can't tell you who they are. At the end of the meeting, a man came to me and said, oh, I know who these three kings are. Prince Charles, George Bush and Tony Blair. That will tell you roughly the time when this happened. I said, how do you know that? He said, oh, I'm a theologian. I know about these kind of things. That was me put in my place, wasn't it? <laughs> the pro you see, this is the problem. Many people, they'll read these passages, and instead of saying, what is the Lord saying to us today, will try and work out detailed programs. Now, that doesn't mean these passages are vague. Isaiah is not saying, wouldn't it be wonderful if there were a king like this? Wouldn't it be great if a golden age were to happen sometime? No, these are pictures given to us of what the future will be like, and they're given to, to help us to live now, to anticipate in our living and in our thinking the world to come. So our title tonight is Your Kingdom Come. The kingdom we already sung about, the kingdom we prayed that will come, your kingdom come, O God, your rule, O Christ, begin. Now, I said last week, these, the background of these chapters is the threat of Assyria way up there on the Tigris, gobbling up the nation of Judah uh, from its capital, Nineveh, which is where the town of Mosul is now. We've heard so much in the news about that city recently in the, in the battle with the Islamic State. But it's not just a message for Isaiah's own time. It's a message for us in our difficult, uncertain world. And there are two questions, really. First of all, what kind of a king will there be? Verses 1 to 8. And then verses 9 to 20, what kind of a kingdom? So, first of all, what kind of a king? Now, this isn't the first time in Isaiah we've met this figure. In chapter 6, Isaiah says, Woe is me, for I my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then in chapter 9, we've met him again, the child with four names, the, ever, the, the eternal God, the child who is to come and who will reign on the throne of David forever. Then in chapter 11, again, the king who is to come, 
and we will meet him again in the next few chapters. So first of all, the nature of this king, verses 1 and 2. Lord Axon, who was a politician at the end of the 19th century, once said, power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts, absolutely. Now that normally happens in, in, in human affairs because no one, no group of people can be trusted with absolute power. Churchill once said, democracy is the worst form of government ever invented apart from all the others. And that's why we need checks and balances. No individual, however good, however gifted, however well-intentioned, can be entrusted with total power. But this king, we are told, will reign in righteousness. When he reigns, there will be no injustice. When he reigns, there will be no oppression. When he reigns, there will be no exploitation of the weak and the disadvantaged. And when he reigns, all unfairness and all inequity will be banished. Now, we do expect this, of course, and hope for this from our leaders, don't we? And we mustn't be cynical. Many of them are well-intentioned people who try very hard. But very often the problem is circumstances throw them, throw them out of balance. They make promises and probably sincerely mean to keep them, and then circumstances happen, which means they can't. The one thing that will never be said about this king is that he encounters circumstances which are beyond his control. You'll never be surprised. You'll never be taken. You'll never be taken at an advantage. A, a, a king will reign in righteousness, and those under him will also. Those who are his people, princes, will rule in justice. Each will be like a hiding place from the wind. Now. This may not be the best translation of that verse 2. The old version says a man will be a hiding place from the wind and a cover from the tempest. And Alec Matir, in his commentary I've mentioned already, says that the verse could be translated this way. A special, one special person who will reign a shelter from the storm. He'll protect people from the storm, the storms of oppression, the storms of terrorism, storms of injustice, the storms, all kinds of storms deflict our mortal life. And he will provide, he will provide streams of water in a dry place and the shade of a great rock in a weary land. Now, of course, all human leaders disappoint in the church as well as in the state. Remember, please, that all leaders are fallible. Let me tell you this. I never realized how great a sinner I was till I went into the ministry. Because dealing with, dealing with the Word of God daily, dealing with seeing the complexities and the difficulties and the and so on, make you very, very conscious of your own weakness. A leader, a preacher, is not somebody who stands six feet above contradiction and lays down the law. A preacher, a leader, is a sinner who is sharing with other sinners what the Lord has given him and what he's discovered from the Word. So, be, be charitable, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. When you, it's so easy to be critical. It's so easy to it's so easy to disparage. Which doesn't mean, of course, as I say, that we we have we have to put we don't put leaders on pedestals, nor do we denigrate them. Sometimes, of course, that's what happens in churches. Ministers are placed on pedestals and then it's kicked out from them, very often by the same people. And that's 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 a very, very bad thing. We are all sinners. We are all subjects of the king. And we all need his grace and forgiveness. My Wesley sang, vile and full of sin I am. You are full of truth and grace. The nature of this king, he will reign in righteousness. And his people in verses 3 to 8. The kind of king that reigns will have an effect on his people. There will be a total transformation. Now I want to say something I think is very important here. I've talked about the sinfulness and the failures and the inadequacies of leaders. But in ancient Israel and in the church, there are sometimes anticipations of the kingdom. King David, 
in his better days. Solomon, in his better days, genuinely anticipated the kingdom. It was a, it was a, real, it was a, a real sense of God on, on, on earth. Um, David says in his last words, when one rules over people with justice, he's like the sun shining or the rain on, on a thirsty ground. A good king, Hezekiah, had come to the throne, a man with faults and flaws like his ancestor David. Nevertheless, a genuine, a genuine picture of the king who is to come. And in, later, in a later generation, his great-grandson, Josiah, was to restore the word of God to the people of God. And there's going to be a, look at, what, look at verses 3 and 4. There's going to be a total transformation. The eyes of those who see will not be closed. Now, earlier chapters in Isaiah have a great deal to say about false prophets bringing delusions and false visions of things that are not going to happen. This king and those who serve him are going to open people's eyes to the light. And that, of course, is what genuine preaching of the Word of God is about. It's opening people's eyes to the light. So that, as the Apostle John says, we can walk in the light. So there's clear vision. There is good listening. The ears of those who hear will give attention. And that, of course, is first of all listening to the Lord himself, listening to the Word as it's expounded. It's also listening to each other and having a genuine, the kind of genuine relationship where genuine confidences can be shared. It's a bad thing in, among God's people. If you can't tell somebody about your weaknesses, for fear it will not be made the subject of gossip. Thinly disguised, of course, as concern for prayer, but there must be an openness, open vision, open good listening, and the heart and the tongue and so on. There must be genuine engagement of heart and mind, spiritual, emotional, and intellectual. A number of years ago, I was at the ordination of somebody who was going into the ministry, and at that ordination, one of the speakers was a former teacher of mine, a man whom I genuinely liked and admire in many ways, and from whom I learned a great deal about the Hebrew language, and one of the things he said was, we mustn't dumb down the message. Far too many ministers seem to have nothing serious to say. And I thought, that's right. Then I thought, the trouble is, you are one of the people who has brought this about. By destroying people's confidence in the word of God, by training people who are going to go out and preach the word, that this word is not reliable, you see, you see the problem. You cannot downgrade the Word of God. You cannot um, teach false doctrine and then expect to produce um, clear vision and good listening and people who are walking in the light. So it all goes together. It's a total transformation of attitude. That, of course, will characterize the kingdom to come. There'll be no lying, there'll be no cheating. There'll be, no, there'll be none of the things that mark so often our relationships on earth. And in verses 5 to 7, basically he's saying that will mean certain people will be discredited. The fool will no more be called noble, nor the scoundrel said to be honorable. Now, the point is, the, the fool here is not somebody who regards themselves as a fool, this is somebody who is wise in their own eyes. Remember, remember the, in the wisdom books, the fool is someone not necessarily denies the existence of God, but lives and talks as if God didn't live, as if he didn't hear, as if he didn't care, and as if, if he didn't judge. And the scoundrel, the person who cares only for himself, will, the fool speaks folly, his heart is busy with iniquity to practice ungodliness, in this face to utter error concerning the Lord. The only way we're going to avoid uttering error concerning the Lord is by sticking to this book. And when we expound this book and all, with all our failures and all our inadequacies, we are opening people's eyes to the light. When we start peddling our own ideas, 
then we begin very easily slip into utter, to utter error concerning the Lord. And that means, among other things, treating the whole of Scripture with seriousness, not just our pet passages and purple passages, but the whole of Scripture. And what does this do? The craving of the hungry is unsatisfied, and the thirsty are deprived of drink. As Milton said, the hungry sheep look up and are not fed. It is the task of the shepherd to feed the sheep. And he who, verse 8, he who is noble plans noble things. Noble here does not, is not so much about rank. It's about character. He who is noble plans noble things. One who digs into the word and brings it to people so that God's, God's word shapes us. And notice the metaphor, hunger and thirst. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. And one thing that happens when the Word of God, it won't happen to everybody, but it will happen to some people at least, when the Word of God is preached, people begin to realize they're hungry. Particularly if they've had a thin diet of people uttering error concerning the Lord. They begin to realize that they're hungry. They want to learn more. They want to feed on the, on the Word of God. So that's the, the kind of king, his nature and his people. Now, what kind of a kingdom, verses 9 to 20? Hear my voice. This is is the key. My sheep, said Jesus, hear my voice, and they follow me. And how will this happen? Now, this puzzling passage, verses 9 to 14, first of all, there is a need to repent. Rise up, you women who are at ease. Hear my voice, you complacent daughters. The prophet speaks here to a group of women who are apparently taking part in a harvest festival. Does this mean the women are specially guilty? Of course not. Most of the book has already been condemning the, the men who are the ruling class in Israel, both in both in church and state. I think what he's trying to get at is that he's if the men won't listen to my voice, maybe the women will, and maybe they'll influence their husbands. Some of you remember that passage in Amos. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who live on the hill of Samaria. I have to say cows of Bashan is not as rude in Hebrew as it is in English. It's hardly a compliment, though. And what are they condemned for? They're condemned for complacency. But if you read that chapter and don't stop chuckling at the cows of Bashan, you'll discover that the wimpish men are being condemned as well. So you see, the point is, the prophet is saying, don't be complacent. Notice notice that the words are used, at ease, complacent. Again in verse 10, complacent. Again in verse 11, complacent. Probably this is an example of faith in the wrong place. If it's a harvest festival, they're probably trusting in the harvest rather than in the Lord of the harvest, probably trusting God's blessings rather than God himself. Verse 12, beat your breasts for the pleasant field or the fruitful vine. Don't trust in these externals. Habakkuk says at the end of his prophecy, though the vine ceases and although, and although there is no growth, yet will I trust in the Lord. And the land is probably devastated. The Assyrian invasion, while it spared Jerusalem, nevertheless devastated the land. We'll see that next week in chapter 33. The point is, it's a warning against complacency. I think about the book of Revelation, the churches in Revelation. What is the church that's most fiercely condemned? Church in Laodicea, which is complacent. You would think when you read, you would think when Laodicea is so condemned, it must have particularly powerful heresies there. There must be particularly personality disputes and bad living. Not a word of any of these. What the risen Lord says to Laodicea, you say you are rich and increased in goods and you need nothing, but I say you are poor and wretched and miserable and blind. And that's what Isaiah is saying here. That's what the Lord is saying through Isaiah. 
There is a need to repent of our complacency. It's so easy to become complacent. So easy just to, just to let things roll on. Then in verses 15 to 20, the need for the Spirit. This kingdom will not come by our own efforts. It will come by the Spirit. A later prophet Zechariah says, Not by might, nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. Now, as I've said before, looking at Isaiah, these prophecies have a local and present fulfillment as well as a future fulfillment. The Spirit is going to rescue Jerusalem, the city of God, from the Assyrians. When the Babylonians destroy the city, the Spirit is going to bring them back because we're told in the beginning of the book of Ezra, the Spirit stirred up the heart of the pagan emperor. The Spirit of God is the one who does the work of God. Lake William Still once said, the the Lord has only one worker, the Holy Spirit. We need to remember that. That's not denigrating the good work that masses of people do, of course. It's basically saying that none of that work, if it's done in our own strength or 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 by our own efforts, is going to achieve anything. Only the Spirit will. The Creator Spirit who swept over the darkness at the beginning of creation and brought life and light. The Spirit of Pentecost. And notice the phrase, verse 15, until the Spirit is poured upon us from on high. And Joel is going to prophesy that and to say that's fulfilled at Pentecost. But it's not just the people, it's the transformed landscape. Verse um, 15 again, the wilderness becomes a fruitful field and the fruitful field is deemed a forest and so on. The king who's coming, the king in righteousness is one who will transform landscape. Notice he's also going to transform society. Justice will dwell and righteousness abide. Now, when the Spirit of God is at work, this kind of thing happens. It happens when a dying church is transformed into a living congregation of God's people. Even happen in communities. There are stories, there are stories, for example, from the time of the great, the great revival in the time of Wesley, of how Wesley visited a community and preached the gospel. And 20 years later, a visitor came to that community to be notorious for its violence and drunkenness. Now, of course, it wasn't perfect. But the change was such. He said, what happened here? An old man says, a man came among us called John Wesley, and he showed us a better way to live. So you see, this isn't just about the future. This is about the present. This is about the spirit of God working among the deadness of sin and death. After all, it's only the spirit who brings life. There's lots of things we can do without the spirit, isn't there? We can educate, we can work hard, entertain, do all kinds of things. The one thing we cannot do is convert someone. One thing we cannot do is cause someone to grow in grace. Only the Spirit can do that. And this leads to harmony. Verse 17, the effect of righteousness will be peace. And the result of righteousness, quietness and trust forever happening when the kingdom comes. But anticipated, as I say, from time to time. But we must learn never to trust those times. Because the point is, um, sometimes, sometimes if we trust God's blessing, we forget that God is still working. This morning, Edinburgh North, we were looking at Habakkuk 1. And Habakkuk 1 is talking about the the coming of the Babylonians, the exile. And he says, I am doing a work in your days, which you would not believe even if you saw it. So we have to believe that even when there are no signs of growth, even when everything looks desolate and dreary, the Lord is doing a work. And that's, that's something we need to hold on to. 
Verse 19 seems a bit out of place. It will hail when the forest falls down. The city will be utterly laid low. I think the point here is it, it's once again speaking about the danger of complacency, the danger of trusting, the danger of trusting in anything other than God. Verse 20, happy are you who sow beside all waters, planted by the stream, as, as in Psalm 1. Let the feet of the ox and the donkey range free. There is plenty for all, not just for human beings, but for the animal creation as well. You see, Isaiah is saying to us, this will happen. It may not happen in... Pro well, obviously it didn't happen in the life, fully in the lifetime of any, of any of his hearers didn't happen fully in the lifetime of, of anyone up to now. Nevertheless, one, because one day it will happen, this ultimately is the only thing that will keep us going in the Christian race. Live now, says Isaiah, in the light of then. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we pray that these glorious truths about the coming king and the coming kingdom will increasingly become part of our living and of our thinking. Help us in dark and bleak days when there seems no signs of green shoots of recovery. Help us to trust that underneath the earth, the way the power, the creator's power is working, that one day there will be a harvest. And we ask this in his name. Amen. Now our final hymn will be on the screen. It's a version of Psalm 72 about the coming king. A king on high is reigning, whom endless ages bless.
The Apostle John said, I heard the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. Until that glad day, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and always. Amen.